There were two signal events that occurred in 1859. One was the publishing of Darwin's Origin of the Species, and the other was the Ulster Revival in Northern Ireland. This revival that began um, a few years earlier, actually, a certain English lady, Mrs. Colville, had confessed Christ as her Savior, and her family had thrown her out. And she had moved to Ireland, to Northern Ireland, and uh, there she, on one occasion, was visiting a home where a woman was dying, and she shared the gospel with this dying person, and a young man by the name of James McQuilkin overheard the conversation, and he responded in faith to the gospel. Well, he was just a young man. This is 1857 in the little town of Kells, County Antrim. But he began meeting with some other young men for prayer. Jeremiah Manili, uh, Robert Carlyle, and John Wallace. And then others began to join. They began to pray that God would work in a powerful way. It's estimated that perhaps more than 100,000 people were saved in Northern Ireland alone. And the, the gospel spread to Scotland and later on to Wales, to England, and overseas. Two of the men that were used in a powerful way during that time were Grattan Guinness and C.H. McIntosh. Now, both of these men tend to be known for their written works, uh, Bible teaching works, especially McIntosh's series on the Pentateuch. But at heart, both of them were evangelists, and they preached the gospel very effectively over those years and saw many hundreds of people trust the Lord Jesus. The story I want to tell you is about Alfred Henry Burton. He was a medical doctor, and in fact, John Nelson Darby died holding his hand. He was giving medical care to Darby when he died. Uh, Burton knew many godly people, many famous Christians during that time, um, like uh, J. Hudson Taylor and, and others of that day. He was a very humble brother. He carried on in the gospel simply and uh, never took a position of, of honor, even though he was born landed gentry. He was born in a, a beautiful country home near Cavan, which is maybe 50 miles or 60 miles south and west of Dublin. And that's where the family home was, Burton Hall. It had a driveway that was a mile long, as straight as an arrow, traveling through the countryside and the estate that the family owned. And I want to tell you a little stories about him. I teasingly asked the question in the title, Is this man your brother? If you belong to the Lord Jesus, you have countless tens of thousands of brothers and sisters you don't even know. Christians from previous centuries, Christians who lived and died in little villages in Africa or in the steppes of Russia or uh, in Mongolia, who knows where. And these uh, multitudes of people that you will meet someday when we finally gather home to glory. Well, Grattan Guinness, who was a member of the Guinness fortune, the, the Guinness is the favorite alcoholic drink in uh, Ireland, and uh, Grattan Guinness turned his back on the wealth and the, uh, the inheritance, and he went out to preach the gospel and uh, was very powerfully used, and he was the man that stirred the hearts of Alfred Henry Burton's parents. Um, the revival began in 1859. It didn't get down to the south of Ireland, where they lived near Cavan, uh, till several years later. I just want to read a few um, parts of the story here. It's really quite fascinating. But um, he said that um, his, his mother was deeply concerned. Grattan Guinness had come and preached in Dublin and a lady who was a marchioness, that would be uh, a marquis's wife. Uh, marquis, I think, are just uh, below a duke and just above an earl, in case you're wondering. 
<laughs> but anyway, this lady got saved, and she invited Grattan Guinness to come and preach in her home. Now, many of these homes, their grand ballroom would hold uh, hundreds of people, and they would use these for the preaching of the gospel. He remembers quite clearly the dramatic change that occurred in his home. He was just nine years old at the time, but the dramatic change that occurred when the gospel came to his family. He said that his home was the center of fashionable life, the scene of uh, uh, parties and balls and hunting and uh, dancing and so on. And, um, and that's how it was when he was a little child. But then when the gospel arrived there in 1863, he says it called a sudden halt to the world of fashion of which it was the chief center in that part of the country. His mother heard the gospel and she was deeply concerned. There was a, a man who came to visit. He was a half-brother of the Marchioness who, who had provided the estate where the gospel had been preached. And uh, he, he had been converted, but he had slipped back uh, because he loved uh, music and uh, he had sort of slipped away from the Lord. But when he saw that uh, um, Dr. Burton's mother was so deeply concerned about her soul, he began to explain to her the plan of salvation, even though he was away from the Lord at the time. And when he saw her converted and rejoicing in her salvation, he himself was restored to the Lord. And they invited C.H. Uh, McIntosh then to come and preach in their home in in uh, Burton Hall and gathered the people around. He said in those days uh, they didn't have bicycles. He had a little pony and uh, it was his job just as a little boy, nine, ten years old, to ride around the village and invite everyone to come and hear the gospel at their home. And he said that on this particular night, C.H. McIntosh was preaching from Isaiah 6 and he his, his message was titled, The Throne and the Altar. And uh, he, be he began to speak about God's glory and majesty and justice. And how could it be for a sinful man like Isaiah to stand in his presence? And then the focus was shifted to the altar and to the sacrifice on the altar. The cry of the sinner, woe is me, for I am undone. And then the wonderful words of Jehovah Thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is purged. Well, the, the place was packed, and nobody wanted to leave. And so they provided supper, which over there is in the early evening. They provided something to eat, and, and many of the people stayed on. And they said, we don't want to leave until we hear some more preaching. And so he rose from supper, and we read that in preaching there, he said, I have left a room full of salvation. And Alfred Henry Burton writes, It is reckoned that every person in the house was saved that night. <laughs> Just amazing. But Oh, there was one woman who wasn't. Uh, she was a proud Presbyterian, loyal to her church, and uh, a very strict character, and she did not feel the need of salvation. But some person who perhaps didn't have the greatest of tact said to her uh, uh, rather harshly, you are in the gall of bitterness and the bond of iniquity. And she was so insulted, so offended, that she went up to her room and locked herself in. And she was there, I think, for two days. And then they noticed a slip of paper had been pushed out under the door, and it simply said, pray for me. And so they did. They began to pray for the woman. And within a short time, the door opened, and out she came, as he says, from her self-imposed imprisonment, rejoicing in her Savior. Uh, the Lord had saved her, not only from her sin, but from her religion. Well, um... One of the stories I thought was good was an uncle of his um, came to came to the home. 
he had left to go to India um, on uh, to with the uh, the British military, and when he left, uh, they were all uh, partying and uh, you know having. Uh, hunting trips and and uh, sports and uh, balls and all the rest, and then he returned. And when he came back, he suddenly found himself. He says, in an atmosphere of the Bible and prayer. What a change! But in a short time, he also trusted the Lord. However, these people, these people, rub shoulders with royalty. They. They had positions in the parliament. They, they had positions of honor in society. And uh, all of a sudden, this man realized that because of his trust in the Savior, he was being pushed out. And it was hard for him to deal with. And so uh, he writes that uh, he returned from Dublin and came to their family estate. And one day he went out and climbed up one of the big trees. And he stayed in the tree, crying out to God, for victory over this going forth outside the camp, bearing Christ's reproach. And when he came down from the tree, Alfred Burton, who was just a, a little boy, climbed up the tree and found that his uncle had carved into the bark one word, victory. <laughs> He'd had victory over the flesh, and he was ready to bear reproach for the Lord Jesus. An interesting little story. I'm just going to slip in here uh, just to show the effect. You know, uh, one of the things that marked this great movement was that those who were in the upper classes um, condescended to men of low estate. They, they went out of their way. In those days, the upper class and lower class did not mix. In these vast homes, there was a staircase at the back for the servants and the stair in the front for the people who lived there. They did not even walk up and down on the same staircase. And uh, so there was a great gulf fixed. So when these Christians began to reach out, and in many of these local fellowships, um, the, the, the lords and ladies would sit and listen to a spirit-filled um, servant who perhaps mucked out their stall or who, who drove their chariot, uh, their, their carriage, or, or who worked in their garden, and uh, a footman. And he would be opening the word of God and preaching, and they would be sitting there listening to him. This was totally radical for the day in which they lived. Well, in his later life, Alfred Henry Burton traveled the world preaching the gospel. He was all over Europe preaching. Uh, he, he went to uh, South America. He went to, to the, uh, Australia, New Zealand, Tasmania, and so on. And he tells uh, about meeting one of the last converts that he knew of the 1859 revival uh, of that period of time. And it was a woman who actually was led to Christ by his mother. Now, his mother was, as I say, landed gentry. And uh, the servants would do everything for these people. But she started going around among the common people, sharing the gospel. And she came to this one woman who was a lodge keeper at, at this grand estate. In other words, she would live in the little house right by the entryway and uh, guard the, the gate for people coming and going on the estate. And, uh, and sh she had um, a bad case of, of bronchitis. And, uh, and so while they were talking, the woman's shawl kept slipping off her shoulders. She was trying to keep it around uh, to keep warm, and it kept slipping, slipping away. And uh, Henry Burton remembers this as a little boy watching his mother, who took the brooch off her own, um, off, off her own shawl, it was a family heirloom, and she took it off, and she clasped it on the woman's shawl to help keep her warm. And the woman was so touched by this, she believed God had shown his love to her through Henry's mother. And, and she, she received the Lord Jesus as her Savior. And so uh, when uh, Dr. Burton was traveling there in Wellington, New Zealand, 
this woman came up to him and told him how his mother had so affected her, thinking that her soul was more valuable than this family heirloom. And she and she took it out and she showed him the brooch that his mother had used to win her heart to the Lord Jesus. I tell you folks, this is real, isn't it? Little kindnesses, we, we hardly think about them. But, but to realize how valuable a soul is. And this dear woman will forever be a worshiper of the Lord Jesus because this wealthy woman was willing to take that family heirloom and use it as the means of sharing the love of the Lord to a poor woman who was a a gatekeeper at the lodge. May the Lord help us to soften our hearts, warm our hearts. What is revival? It's just a fresh beginning of obedience to God. And this great revival, it was linked to prayer. It was linked to the word of God. It was linked to a love for people and practical expressions of kindness that led to the salvation of hundreds of thousands of souls as a result.